This video is about one of the most profound chapters Nietzsche has ever written. It's only about 200 words long in the original German. But in those few words, Nietzsche retraces the entire history of the idea of the Hinterwelt, of the age-old philosophical idea that this world, the material world of the here and now, is not the real, true world, but that there is another world, something beyond this world, in which the true meaning and goal of our existence is found. Welcome to our video on Nietzsche's Twilight of the Idols, Chapter 5. How the real world became a myth. Enjoy, and don't forget to like and subscribe. The chapter in question consists of six steps, each accompanied with a sentence or so of commentary. Each step represents a development in the idea of the Hinterwelt. A quick reminder, the Hinterwelt is Nietzsche's term for the philosophical concept of a beyond world. The idea that the material, immediate world of the here and now is not the world of supreme importance. Rather, the Hinterwelt is the place, which may or may not be accessible to us, where we find true meaning and fulfillment. The Hinterwelt appears in many forms throughout the history of philosophy. In this chapter, Nietzsche traces its most important developments in six stages. The first stage Nietzsche describes as follows. The true world, attainable to the sage, the pious man and the man of virtue. He lives in it. He is it. The first stage is Platonism. The real world is the platonic world of forms, attainable only to the wise or the philosopher. Just as a cup participates in the idea of cupness, so do the wise participate in the idea of truth and the virtuous in the idea of justice, or even more fundamentally, in the idea of good. The particulars of platonic theory aside, the important idea to take note of is that for Plato, and much of Western philosophy onwards, we have the idea that the material world is not the most important world there is. That there is something beyond, more real than real, so to speak. In Plato, this is the world of forms. Nietzsche says as much in his commentary. The most ancient form of the idea was relatively clever, simple, convincing. It was a paraphrase of the proposition, I, Plato, am the truth. However, Throughout the history of ideas, this platonic ideal would soon morph into something else. What happens to the real world? Let's say 500 years later. The true world, which is unattainable for the moment, is promised to the sage, to the pious man and to the man of virtue, to the sinner who repents. We see a first development. Notice how in stage 1, Platonism, the real world, which is the world of forms, was accessible to men of wisdom and virtue. To use the proper term, we say wise men participate in the idea of truth. Now, we read that the true world is unattainable for a moment. In other words, we cannot participate in the real world any longer. Instead, the real world is something that is promised to us. The real world is therefore in the future and not in the present. In the moral sphere, we also see a new definition of virtue. The virtuous person is the sinner who repents. Let's put the elements together. We have repenting sinners, a real world which is unattainable in a moment, yet is promised to those who live a good life, well, Nietzsche is, of course, alluding to Christianity. 
progress of the idea. It becomes more subtle, more insidious, more evasive. It becomes a woman. It becomes Christian. The Hinterwelt has progressed. First, it was the Platonic world of forms, and now, under the influence of Christianity, it has transformed into heaven, the afterlife, or the kingdom of God. Where does it go from here? The true world is unattainable. It cannot be proved. It cannot promise anything. But even as a thought, alone, it is a comfort, an obligation, a command. In the third stage, the real world is not even promised to us. We see how gradually the real world is slipping away from us. First, we could participate in it. Then, we were promised that someday in the future we would participate in it. And now, the real world has become simply a thought, an empty concept. Yet, Nietzsche describes it as a comfort, an obligation and even a command. We are, of course, talking about Kant. At bottom, this is still the old sun, but seen through mist and skepticism. The idea has become sublime, pale, northern, Königsbergian. Kant famously lived in the Prussian town of Königsberg, which is located in modern-day Russia. Nietzsche makes a poetic allusion to the cold northern climate when he posits that under the influence of Kant, the real world has become similarly cold and pale. There is no life in it anymore. The real world exists simply as a concept. We are, of course, talking about the infamous Kantian Ding an sich, or the thing in itself. In stage 3, this is the form of the Hinterwelt. Remember, the thing in itself is the Kantian term for the world as it is without interference of our perception. The world as pure object. More importantly, for Kant, this means that the world as it really is, is essentially unknown to us by definition. The reason why this is so, is because with Kant, the distinction between object and subject becomes blurred. We don't have time to offer an in-depth explanation of Kantian philosophy in this video, but if you're curious, we explain the basics of Kant's metaphysics in part 1 of our series on Schopenhauer's The World as Will and Representation. Nietzsche speaks in terms of obligations and commands, because Kant's morality was based on obligation or duty. We are compelled to act a certain way because of the categorical imperative, which is a command of reason. We see how the Hinterwelt has undergone a transformation from an actual world to a potential world, to a world that is not even potentially attainable. The Hinterwelt is forever beyond our grasp. Where do we go from here? The true world. Is it attainable? At any rate, it is unattained. And as unattained, it is also unknown. Consequently, it no longer comforts, nor saves, nor constrains. What could something unknown constrain us to? With Kantian philosophy stretched to its logical conclusion, we lose all purpose for the Hinterwelt. With Kant, we learned that the real world is unattainable. If it's unattainable, then it's also unknown. What use do we have for the unknown? Nothing. Nietzsche is alluding to the rise of positivism, empiricism, and even scientism. The idea that the material world is actually the real world and that we have no need for a Hinterwelt or even metaphysics in general. The grey of dawn. Reason stretches itself and yawns for the first time. The cockcrow of positivism. Nietzsche is probably alluding to the influential works of Auguste Comte in this section. Here, we have the idea that the material world is the real one and that all knowledge must be based in empirical data or mathematical proof. The Hinterwelt is gone, a relic of the past. The true world, an idea that no longer serves any purpose, that no longer constrains one to anything, 
a useless idea that has become quite superfluous. Consequently, an exploded idea. Let us abolish it. Nietzsche is referring to the current state of philosophy in this stage. The real world has been abolished. We have no need for it any longer. Science and logic offer enough of an explanation. We might say that Nietzsche's famous phrase, God is dead, is applicable to this stage. We have no basis for metaphysics, no basis for morals. We have done away with the Hinterwald at last. We have done away with this error in history. Is this cause for celebration? Bright daylight, breakfast, the return of common sense and of cheerfulness. Plato blushes for shame and all free spirits kick up a shindy. Of course, there is still one stage left. What is next? We take a look at the future. We have suppressed the true world. What world survives? The apparent world, perhaps? Certainly not. In abolishing the true world, we have also abolished the world of appearance. With the death of God, which is another way of saying the abolishment of metaphysics, which is another way of saying the end of the Hinterwald, we have done away with the metaphysical dualism that has accompanied humanity for the better part of 3000 years. There is no longer any meaningful distinction between the real world and the world of appearance. We have rid ourselves of a grave error and free ourselves from all kinds of metaphysical constraints. Whereas the previous stage was formulated as a negation, we have abolished the Hinterwald. In the sixth and final stage, we see Nietzsche's affirmation. What comes next? Noon. The moment of the shortest shadows. The end of the longest error. Mankind's zenith. Incipit Zarathustra. The beginning of Zarathustra. In the sixth stage, we begin the process of creating a new morality. This is where Nietzsche's philosophy begins. A bold look at the future. Nietzsche will propose a transvaluation of all values. He will introduce the idea of the Übermensch and the will to power. All of this embodied in the image of Zarathustra. This is the development of the Hinterwald as sketched out by Nietzsche in a mere 200 words. In effect, we have an entire summary of Western philosophy in just these two pages. We will end with Nietzsche's bold call for the creation of a philosophy of the future. What will that philosophy look like? If you're interested in exploring this topic further, we highly recommend you watch our series on Beyond Good and Evil. We'll link it in the description. The book is subtitled A Prelude to a Philosophy of the Future for a Reason. You can also watch our series on the genealogy of morals if you're interested in a more in-depth look at the history of morality and the Hinterwald. And finally, subscribe to our channel if you liked this video. There is more Nietzsche coming out, and by subscribing and clicking the bell button, you'll stay up to date on new videos. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.